What's up, everyone? Jeremy Dog Q and A on a Thursday, six p.m. Every Thursday, six p.m. Central Standard Time. So if you catch this after about seven, we are no longer live and we cannot answer your questions. But we always start at the same time every week at six p.m. Where you guys ask as many questions as you like and. I try and try my best to answer all the questions. Okay? You can also email me with questions, inbox me with questions, or um, ask them here. Feel free to ask as many as you like. All right? Let's get to it. <clears throat> okay, first question is for... All right. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, this question is for Zach. Hi, Jeremy, my dog, buddy, six-year-old German Shepherd, seems to be reactive, anxious to other dogs regardless of their size. Even when we go for a ride and he's in the car, if he sees another dog, he begins to, he begins barking and reacting to seeing the other dog. Suggestions on what to do. All right, so pretty simple. Uh, explanation if you have a dog that's reacting in the way that you don't see uh, you know conducive then you have to add structure in any environment where the dog is acting out so on the walk you should your goal should be to have your dog walk beside you no sniffing no peeing, no pooping for 90% of the walk. The dog should, that's just, this is how you add structure to the walk. So very, very simple. Um, the dog should be walking beside you, loose leash walking and uh, not pulling you at all. Okay. That's how you add structure to your walk. That's how you get the dog to actually respect you and not ignore you because chances are the dog is ignoring you and doing what it wants or what it feels he needs to do. And so on the walk, that's how you add structure. Okay, I have a YouTube video, a whole do-it-yourself kind of playlist, and it'll explain in depth how to uh, walk the dog on leash, structure walk. Okay, in the car, same thing. You gotta give the dog a job to do, very important. Uh, for puppies, it's very important when you're, <clears throat> when you're in the car, have the dog in a crate. Start the dog off in a crate. Do not allow the dog to have free roam in your car. All right. Just to make sure that your dog doesn't develop any sort of sort of car anxiety or aggression towards people in the car or dogs or whatever. Um, that's how you add structure in the car. But more so than that, you also have to give the dog something to do in the car. You can't just have free roam with the car. If the dog has free roam with the car, then the dog is free to also act how it wants to act in the car. Um, so one of the things that I teach dogs here is to lay down while we drive. Okay, so it should be a nice, comfortable, relaxing car ride. Dog shouldn't be panting, have any sort of anxiety. The dog should just be calm and quiet in the car. Okay, make sure that you know, again, if you're starting off with a new dog that may have those issues that you are crating the dog in the car. It's not only safer, but it's also uh, better for them mentally. All right. Thank you for your question. All right, we got a question on YouTube. Uh, by the way, folks, we are live on YouTube um, as well. So for some reason, if Facebook says, I don't really want to deal with you anymore, then you can head over to YouTube and find us there. All right, question on Facebook, I mean YouTube, is what's the quickest way to make a, a aggressive dog to the opposite? Uh, add structure to the dog's environment. Be the parent. 
and not the dog's friend. Guide the dog to what it's fearful of. Give the dog enough time to be calm, to become calm amongst its fears, and you'll see that the dog loses its fear. Okay, thank you for your question. All right, next question. Let's see if I've got some live here. All right, so next question. Uh, my pup was recently suggested to try some natural anxiety treats to help his anxiety. Granted, he has a lot, he has a lot, and it's hard to work the high energy and the anxiety about everything uh, myself. It was suggested to help him limit one so we can work through the rest. I had him on it for like two weeks. I took, then I took him off. There was been a very minimal difference on or off the meds for most days. I still give him when we are working super high anxiety things to help him stay in a, in a zone. He can listen to me. Honestly, I found time not impatient, forceful commands, and just paying attention to everything my pup is saying or asking has made way more of a difference than those anxiety meds. And sadly, physical exercise only drains him so much. I need to keep finding new mental games, tricks to teach him to drain him instead. Then, he looks for direction uh, a lot more now. Since he learned, if he does not know, no and looks to me, I will provide him with a little more guidance of what I am asking him to do. Instead of uh, him freaking out and getting worked up, uh, he doesn't know what we're asking him to do. Okay, there wasn't a question there. I guess that was a suggestion or a, just a comment, but. Looks like you're doing things the right way. I will continue to, I mean, Seems like you're, um, you've got to kind of figured out. Uh, just stay patient with those things that you're enforcing, and I think you should be all right. Um, One thing that I would, uh, you, you know, know, recommend is I know that meds take more than a week to might to to have an effect. So I talked to your vet about that. If you only tried it for a week, I don't think you'll see. Although I'm not. Pro meds, okay. So I don't make, don't get me wrong on that. I definitely think training is is um, the first thing that we should go to instead of meds. But talk to your vet. Depending on the type of meds that you're using, it could probably take more than a week to see what you're wanting to see. But I'm no vet. I don't know. I don't know much about it. All right. But thank you for your question. Okay. Let's see. Got a couple questions on Instagram. All right. Here we go. When house training, how can I get the focus on using the bathroom outside when we're when we are outside? I will take him outside first thing when coming out of his crate. Sometimes I can be walking him outside for 20 minutes and he will not use it. As soon as we come inside, he will use the bathroom on the cart. Every time. He uses the bathroom outside. I praise him and give him a treat. Uh, what's the proper way to handle the situation when he uses the bathroom in the house? Um, so, you know, what you could do, if you don't have a fenced-in yard, what, what, you know, if you have a fenced-in yard, let the dog out and leave the dog alone. Or go back inside. You know, it may hit him. He, he may have a timer and he'd be like, okay, now I got to go to the bathroom, right? Okay. 
That's one of the things that I would do. Or you can hang outside with him, but don't really interact with him. Just walk to the area where you would like him to go. He or she should follow you. And then he may or may not go. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't go, you know, um, and you bring him back inside, then he's got to go back in the crate. But, um, so that he doesn't get used to, he doesn't get free roam of the house, basically, unless... Um, the dog is already peed and pooped and you've seen it All right, so I just hang out with my dogs outside and Ignore them. I don't really You know talk to them or play with them or whatnot and it'll hit them You know sooner or later, but if it doesn't and you want to go back inside then um, You know put them back in the crate and Wait another you know ten minutes and try it again. You can also tie them out if you don't have a fence in the yard just tie them out and uh, just literally leave them out there. Poke your head out, see if you see poop or whatnot. And um, and I don't really care too much about praising the dog unless the dog goes outside and goes right away. Then I may praise them, but I don't. It's not that crucial to me uh, as far as you know getting the dog to understand that this is where you go. The praising, in my opinion, does not. Uh, help the dog learn that this is where you go okay um, and so when he does go inside I don't really I don't really punish them for that either at all um, I just think it's a situation where you know it's our fault and basically we just gotta you know take that loss and uh, try and uh, you know make it better the next time so I don't really, especially if the dog hasn't gone outside, you know, um, and you let him free roam with, without going to the bathroom outside, it's really not his, his fault. So still learning, but, um, the more times he pees outside and goes in that same area, the more likely the dog will sniff there, pee there and poop there. All right. Thanks for your question. Okay, next question. Okay, I'm fostering a one-year-old palm chi. When I'm eating and my dogs are sitting beneath me, she growls. I snap my fingers and say no. I've also used the pet commissioner. Should I crate her when I eat? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that would be an option. Or you can teach the dog the place command. Um, you know, that's tough. You know, I just, I don't, one of the things I do is that don't let dogs around the table when there's food. I put them on their bed. Put them on their place. And, uh, and then once the food is off the table and we're done eating and all that, you know, then I don't care about what they do. But when I'm eating and we're, when we're on the table, the dogs are not around. They are. On their bed or um, well no, they're on their bed they're no, nowhere else but on the bed so that's how you prevent any of that uh, potential uh, misbe misbehave misbehavior from the other dogs all right thank you for your question okay I got a couple questions from last week that I didn't get to and I think I want to try and get to those uh, okay, here we go. I think I want to address these. I have an e-collar. I have e-collar training for my four-year-old husky mix due to fence fighting with my neighbor's dog. My question is when, uh, my question is when escalates, I crank it up, crank up the e-collar to 130 and it seems he doesn't even acknowledge it. I am using a dog, a dog tra 280. C e collar. Okay, you know, there's a lot of people that struggle with this, so I'm kind of going to go into a deeper explanation as to the purpose of tools, no matter what the tool is. Okay. Okay. Remember this: tools are only temporary, and in order to move forward 
from tools, e-collars, prong collars, leash, collar, uh, gentle leader, uh, harness, uh, all, any tool, any and every tool. The way that you get more of a, uh, I would say, a, a, let's say a better trained response or a, um, just a, you know, you be, you're able to reach the dog because in with certain dogs that come to me for training, the prong collar doesn't work. The e-collar doesn't work. Um, the gentle leader doesn't work. All these all these collars don't work, but here's the problem. The problem is people are using the tool as the solution where when the solution, I mean, the, 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 the tools are only the, the, a supplement to what you should be using to reach the dog. Okay. So I always tell people we train with layers. Okay. So one layer of tools would be your voice. The other would be your, your e-collar. Another would be the leash. Another would be a long line or prong collar, whatever it is. Um, and when we're starting off training our dogs, we want to have every single tool available to us. Or we want to have at least two tools. Your voice is always going to be there. No matter what. You're going to be able to speak to your dog. Okay. Most people. And, um, but if your dog does not take your word for it, right? When, meaning if you say come and your dog does not come, you're going to have to add a layer in the form of a long leash or a knee collar, or, you know, you can even throw in treats as a tool, a teaching tool, not a, proofing tool um but so in your case with the e-collar the dog doesn't respond to uh 130 but okay so what you have to do is start adding your voice to get involved with the correction from the e-collar and, and and but before that though you also want to use the e-collar in other ways other than just uh, punishing the dog for um, the behavior that you seem uh, unfit or dangerous. So start using the e-collar for recall. Start using the e-collar, excuse me, for um, for making the dog go lie down on his bed. But let's just stick with recall. So when there's no dogs in the yard, you can practice the dog, practice and I bet you you'd be able to work at a much lower level. Practice with the dog, mm -hmm. teaching the dog to come. All right, via e collar. And then the dog will start to take your word for it, as opposed to you know uh, receiving the e collar correction and and nothing happens. Sometimes dogs intensify from it. Right, so you'll get a lot of dogs who, who intensify from these tools, and a lot of positive only trainers will, will, will capitalize on that. They'll say it makes them more aggressive, and it's like, no, it doesn't. They just don't know how to use the tools properly. At the end of the day, again, you want the dog to take your word for it. When I say come, it means come. If you don't take my word for it, I have to use something to help you take my word for it at the end of the day so that we can one day just say come and you actually do it reliably all right that's that's the magic of tools tools are not the solution though okay it's tools combined with uh certain things or layers that are at a all together going to make the big difference but you can't rely on any one tool uh, in a, on its own. All right. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> hey, got a couple questions live. Let's check them out. Where are we at? There we go. 
Okay. All right. Two questions. I feel like my dog is getting used to the prong collar and is pulling on it. And it doesn't mind. <laughs> it doesn't mind if it's tight or I if I tug or um, give a correction. Should I use the e-collar too? How would I use it? Also, when I go on walks, how can I get my dog to pay attention to me versus constantly looking for a rabbit or a squirrel? All right. So the first question, we'll answer the second question. All right. If you get that walk, if you get the dog to care about what you want, um, then the dog won't be constantly looking for squirrels and rabbits. Okay. So if the dog, and this is what we were just talking about, the dog stopped uh, talking or caring about the prong collar and is pulling. Yes, you could use the e collar exactly the same way as far as what you want with the prong collar. I would uh, start with the e collar and I would press the button and say back. Okay, make the dog heal with you using your word back or, or heal, whatever you want to say, um, if the dog gets in front of you. All right, and remember that the dog, uh, we want to be as gentle as possible with that, but we also have to be firm as necessary. So if it doesn't work, then you have to go up. Your level, your working level doesn't go up, then go up by three or four and repeat. Okay, but use your, make sure you're using your words at the same time you're pressing the button so that you can use your words without the button, before, without the e-collar eventually. All right, thank you for your question. All right, what do you feel are the realistic expectations for an owner that has a young, high, dry female shepherd in protection work to live peacefully in a house with three other dogs, one being the same age female? They have gotten into a few scuffles already around the owner and both high energy. What do you recommend to the best way to have these dogs coexist? Um, shoot. That's a tough situation. I can probably already guess that, you know, those, those, the owners are just not, uh, they don't have enough time with all those dogs. Um, you know, yes, they are high drive. You know, I, I don't care how dry, how high of a drive the dog is. They can learn to be very calm. I've owned very high drive, you know, high driven dogs and the same rules apply for a low drive dog. Okay, I don't, I don't take that into account. Yeah, it is a, it is a factor and it does matter, but um, it, you know, when I want my dogs to be calm, they're calm. And that's what has to happen here. They have to be able to get each and every dog calm, you know, and um, so when I'm working with uh, a person that has multiple dogs, I say one or two things have to happen. Either I train all the dogs, or you take what you learn from this dog, and you apply it to the other dogs. But all the dogs have to have the same rules. You know, it's gonna be very hard and challenging, if not impossible, for a couple of dogs to stay on its bed, while other dogs get to go bark. You know, things like that. And so the goal should be, again, to teach them how to Get the dogs to be calm on command, and you'll see that the fights uh, will stop. Hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, ask me another question. Okay. All right, just got a seven-week-old pit bull one day ago. Do you have any training classes for that age? No, and no one should. It's too young. What's a good age to start? We also have a two and a half year old pit bull and a six month old Yorkie Terrier who's very high strung. Thinking training classes would be good for the Yorkie mix as well. What's a good age? We can leave the new puppy with the other two. We are keeping her separated until she's older. <laughs> okay. All right, so first of all, um, let's just talk about classes for a second. Okay, uh, classes. I don't agree with classes. 
I know that there may be trainers that just provide that as their sole service. Okay. I sympathize with that. Hey, Pat, how are you? Um, I, I want to ask, I want to ask Pat a question too. I want to ask you a question, um, about labs later on. All right. So back to my question, classes. I don't, I don't agree with classes as being your, what your primary source of dog education should be. Classes are, should be, should be supplemental to your dog's education. Hey, Maylee, long time. Um, your, yeah, classes should be a supplement to your dog's education, core education. It kind of be like electives, right? If your dog's in college, you got to get those core classes in, but you can also sign up for PE or like, you know, it's like maintenance. It's like good maintenance, right? But it should not be the sole, you know, source of education. Classes are unrealistic. Okay. And most dogs have territorial things that they have to work out. Okay. Territorial and, um, and walking, right? All out on a walk. Two of which you cannot duplicate in a class. Mm -mm, can't do it. Classes are unrealistic. They could also be counterproductive if they're not conducted properly. You shouldn't walk into a class with a bunch of dogs barking, with a bunch of dogs pulling, with a bunch of dogs meeting on leash. I mean, if you have a specialty kennel club and they're all, you know, Nova Scotia duck toning retrievers and they're all like, you know, happy, go lucky, whatever, do what you want. I still have a problem with that, but whatever. Um, but again, we're, we are so class driven, focused with dogs, like all these dog owners. Oh, let's take our dog to class. Let's go to class, 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 class. You can find classes. They're cheap and all that and this, that, and the other. It's like, okay, well, okay. But these classes are... Again, not realistic, first and foremost. Um, secondly, they don't really teach dogs how to be patient. They just teach the dog how to be pushy, in my opinion. And you're also teaching the dog how to be impatient. Because when you train with treats, after the dog learns what you do. Okay, so treats, in my opinion, are good to teach an actual skill. It makes it easy for them to get. But now, how do you work through refusal? How do you get to reliability with treats? I don't think you can. Well, I know you can't. Okay? And so, it's real simple for a puppy to learn those the simple tricks down stay if it's food motivated but you can also teach a puppy how to respect or how to get um, reliability you can teach a puppy reliability from their refusal because they because they elect to refuse so so i i think people underestimate the intelligence of a puppy Every single interaction you have with your puppy, you can teach respect. Or you can teach them that they don't have to respect. Every single interaction. There's, there should be no way that you have a Great Dane uh, or a, a dog, whatever. A, a dog over 100 pounds that thinks it's okay to jump on people. Like, if there's one thing you should have taught your dog that's over 100 pounds, it should be not 
to jump. One thing. That's because it's it's huge. The dog is going to hurt someone. Or hurt a child. So if you're a big so chances are you ever work with a dog that's big and the dog jumps on you, there's probably a whole, whole bunch of problems, a whole bunch of other problems that the dog um has. Because again, that would probably be the first thing I teach is a big dog. Um, I I forgot my my oh my whole point is this. Okay. Again, guys, I'm gonna say this every time it comes up because I definitely think so. The best education you can have, especially if your dog is, I don't you know. Okay, it's one thing if your dog is fearful in any way or aggressive in any way. But if your dog is just a puppy, um, uh, I'd say a good starting age would be, you know, for you guys, it's right away. But after the third round of shots, you know, then, um, you know, your journey starts when you bring your dog home. But after the third round of shots, um, the dog can, can, can now go to places where there's a lot of dogs and safely uh, integrate and all that good stuff because its immune system is whatever right to a certain spot um, So I would say the board and train is a very good option. It's going to be more expensive obviously But you can get what you pay for okay, you 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 it's an investment. It's like sending your kid off to college It's the safest way for the trainer and the dog and society for the dog to go away from the owner and go away from its environment because a fearful and aggressive dogs they're almost always going to be territorial and protective of their owners you eliminate those two you have a much less chance of getting bit but as a trainer and getting someone else bit and they're also more open to learn because of the change of environment. It's like, hmm, things aren't the same. Okay, this is particular. This is peculiar. Hmm. You can optimize the ability to, for the dog to receive, you know, teaching from you when you put the dog in a different environment. Okay, because it's like a drug addict. Like someone that's, you know, addicted to something, it does have something to do with what their envi environment calls for. And that's why they send them away for rehab, rehabilitation. That's why we call it rehabilitation. All right. I need some, to get to some other questions. Uh, let's see. Is it a contradiction with the protection work of that one female? No, I don't think you should even you know, consider uh, what protection work does or doesn't, okay? You know, again, I have worked with dogs who have, you know, you know, shits in three uh, with titles or whatever, just pronounced in, uh, I have dogs that are very, very good and intense uh, bite work dogs. And, you know, if I, you know, showed you their behavior in the house, you would never know it. Um, and so, you know, the, the best, you know, you can build an all, all around dog, you know, um, I'm willing to bet that, you know, even the top dogs, even the dogs that are championship bloodline, you know, like the top dogs in protection, those dogs are very calm in certain circumstances. All right. They're balanced because they're 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 able to use their brain. And I was talking about this the other day. So you have, and this goes with okay, so Pat, this also ties into the question for Pat. What's up with these labs lately, man? Man, these labs, they're crazy. Oh man, I don't know what's going on. Somebody, somebody's, something's going on. There, I mean, I've talked to you know general managers at at dog daycare. 
you know, these labs are, 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 okay, they may be good for hunting, but boy, do you have a hard time not getting them to be so reactive. You know what I mean? Um, uh, I have two, I actually have, I actually used to work with a couple in, uh, Marinette, Wisconsin that had a lab that, um, again, was a very championship bloodline hunter, but could not for the, you know, for the life of the dog control its own impulses. Like, you know, and no, and no matter what you did to the dog, it was just like, I don't care. Let's have a good time. It's a, they're partying. They're like, <laughs> whatever you do, you know, it's like <laughs> just super reactive and, um, and, and hard to reach for that, for that matter. So, uh, look at people typing in look at these labs, 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 man, they're there. I don't know what's going on, man. I don't, you know, and, uh, so I, I want to get to some questions and I'll come back. <laughs> I told you my lab. Yeah. Your lab puppy is crazy. I'm glad you're watching. <laughs> Um, but he's a good, he's a good dog. He's really, really a good dog. Um, all right, here we go. Hold on. Where's Maylee's question at? Where did you, where'd it go? Where'd it go? We took our boxer mix to a reactive rover class and it was complete waste of time and money. See? See what I'm saying? I'm saying, man. You, ugh, good Lord. Classes. Uh, I think they've gotten lost. I guess what I'm asking is, will enforcing the calm in the house and the calm uh, walk have any impact on our... I, no, it will not, I promise you. Great question, though, because there's a lot of people who think that, but it will not impact anything. The environment calls for the behavior, and when they're in that per environment for their protection work, it will be different, okay? Again, I used to take my dog, right? And it could be anywhere, and I want the dog to be calm anywhere I want the dog to be calm. But when that when that sleeve comes out, um, and when that, you know, when 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 I have my suit on, then the dog can go nuts because it calls for it. The environment calls for it. So no, not at all. It will not affect it. As a matter of fact, it will improve it. Okay, if you're if you can teach that dog to be calm, it will improve the bite work. It pr I promise you, you will develop a dog who actually uses his brain during bright bite work, as opposed to saying, I want to bite, I want to bite, I want to bite, I want to bite. Yes. And so that's the big difference with, with good bite work trainers and not good bite work trainers. You want to build a dog who is crazy, but also can actually take direction when the dog is in crazy mode. Okay. And... If you're just wanting the dog to be crazy, then you're just building a dog that's super reactive and those dogs are actually dangerous dogs. Those dogs shouldn't be doing bite work and they will not perform well because they're, they've been taught to be, to be reactive and reinforced to be reactive. But if, if, if the dog, um, if the dog, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Uh oh, oh, sorry guys. Um, if the dog is actually spends time using its brain, uh, then the dog will use its brain more. Okay, so it'll actually be beneficial um, to the dog to be to 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 uh, to experience calmness. Okay, you don't want a dog that is not able to be calm. That's that's dangerous. Um, so the other thing is, um, shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. Too much crap in my brain. Okay. Well, we'll just go to the next question. If it pops up, I'll, uh, I'll answer that for you. Yeah, there's no excuse for being a spaz. No, no. No, I don't care if you're a, I don't care if you're a champion. A house calls for calm. The training field. Have at it. Have at it. Okay. 
What do you start with severe anxiety, uh, such as self-harm, licking paws, and hurting itself to escape? Any tips and techniques? Um, yeah, there's a couple of them. Um, so right now, I do have a Malinois who will chew on his paws in place. Um, and I did have a dog who a long time ago would chase its tail. But the dog, what you want to learn is what triggers that anxiety? What are the patterns? Right? Sometimes I think we overlook certain things as, you know, hmm, well, the dog's just damn crazy. He just does it. Or it just soothes them. Or it just, uh, it's just what he does as an excuse to not be consistent about blocking that behavior. Okay, so I personally can say I've never had a dog after training with me go into that behavior. Go into those crazy uh, behaviors. Okay, because I, one thing that I'm good at is I am there every single step of the way. There, I'm not going to skip steps and allow the dog's anxiety to go up at all. We're going to squash this thing right down here. I'm not going to squash it with up here because it's tough. To eliminate when it when it rises, I'm gonna squash it when he looks like he's gonna chew on his paw, and not when he's chewing on his paw, right? Um, and so you gotta try and find. First of all, your training is going to help it in general. Just getting the dog to clear its mind. I really think dogs need to, and this is why again this board and train is really important. Well. I mean, you can get there with private lessons, but you, you want an environment where the dog can clear its freaking mind of being reactive. This is what causes the anxiety. This is what causes the chewing, the spinning, the shadow chasing. I had a dog uh, that would that would that came to me and would obsessively uh, chase shadows, this, that, and the other. Did not do it once while we were in training. The go-home session, the dog started doing it. Why? The owners were there. And it provoked that old, you know, way of living just because the owners were there. Okay, so you can eliminate those obsessive behaviors with um, the right amount of structure and you know, time and consistency with blocking that behavior. You know what I mean? Um, again, I mean, I have that video of the dog on YouTube that really went at his paw over and over and over and over again, man. And, um, you know, once, and then through training, he did not do it because I gave him something to do every single time he needed it. And then you see that the dog loses its need to do it. It sometimes soothes them. Yes, it does. But I don't want my—I don't want any behavior to be obsessive with my dog. None. And I will stop it if it becomes too much. My my female, she likes to groom herself, and I stop it because the licking sometimes is so like loud and obnoxious i can't even hear my tv shows all you hear is <laughs> and i'm like oh my god let him stop like take a break you know it's like yes but but um so i so i don't allow any obsessive behavior to go on okay you know and and um and and it's interesting again how much structure uh, really, really can take away all of that obsessive behavior. So, um, yeah, you know that's the tough one. That's a tough one. Um, you know, uh, that would be a case for a board and train. I would say because you also have to figure out what works. Uh, there's several different ways that may work. Um, sometimes a prong collar correction would work. Sometimes a doggy don't would work. Sometimes a, you know a water bottle squirt would work. For the right dog, uh, sometimes a pet commencer and sometimes the e-collar would work. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I tell people, you know, 
if your dog has any sort of aggression or fear, um, you're definitely the only way that I'm really going to work with you. First of all, I don't do private lessons as, uh, yeah, I haven't done them in like, I don't know, four or five, uh, since last year, long time. I've cut them out. I'm just, I'm just doing boarding trains because I want to spend a lot of time with the dogs that I have. And, um, and I don't have time for private lessons. Um, you know, those minor issues people can see other trainers for, you know, um, when they, when they, when dogs have deeper rooted issues, then they can come and see me. But, uh, so yeah, that's all I'll have to say about that. Okay. We got some other questions. First time you're here. Hello. How are you? Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. All right. Uh, I'm fostering a bully breed who is high reactive with other animals and whines and cries and lunges. I've never seen this in my life. It's worse when I'm seeing them move. Oh, it's worse when seeing them move. He's been taught with positive reinforcement and has a bad and has had improvement with that trainer. But now he's in my household with that trainer. He's back to being completely without the trainer. He's back to being completely terrified of seeing them. Any tips and tricks? Um, it's really hard to get him outside to just walk and it breaks my heart. All right, um, so what you have to do is be able to reach that dog in that environment. You have to be able to get him to respond to you. The dog's fear is so high that um, the dog is starting to lunge at them. So why don't you create more space, first of all, right? With the dog and whatever it's lunging at. Um, and you have to be able to do one of two things. You have to be able to either correct the dog's behavior with punishment or you have to be able to stand out there long enough for the dog to actually get bored with it. But I'm going to say you should probably go with the first one because you want your dog listening to you uh, during any uh, situation where the dog perceives to be a stressful situation. Okay, so we all know that life can be stressful you know, whatever. But if we have a dog who, who looks to us as their leader or their teacher, then they're able to learn about certain, um, about certain, uh, stresses or stressful environments or whatever they're fearful of or anything like that. So if your dog decides to lunge at anything or anything like that, you have to tell the dog no, that it can't do that. And again, we, you know, I know, you, I know you worked with the other trainer and all this, that, and the other, and treats were the uh, strategy there. But I'm going to tell you, treats are, treats are not going to work in a stressful environment. Okay, there's no dogs... You know, there's dogs that have huge appetites or food drive, whatever you want to call it. But if a dog reaches a certain level of stress, I don't care if you have the highest uh, food driven dog. Dog's not going to uh, um, uh, uh, care about the food. But it, what it can care about is you. All right. So you can also start getting the dog to engage with you more in other environments, not just that environment. So be more tough on the dog inside the house. And I say that all the time, but you don't have to be as tough with them on the outside if you're just a little bit more tough with them in the inside. You know, um, making the dog uh, do things to a certain level, Ch challenge the dog even more inside. So, so if you don't have the ability to say, go lay down on, the, on, the, on, on, on your bed, you know, go lay down or if you don't have the ability to keep your dog out of the kitchen, or if you don't have the ability to open the door and your dog now rush out of the door, um, then those things you can clean up and it will help in the environment where it really matters. Okay, so look for things. If your dog jumps, if your dog barks, if your dog does anything that isn't, um, you know, good in the inside, getting your dog to really uh perfect those things are going to make a big difference when it matters in the in the big time environment all right so 
Look for things other than that environment to help your dog listen to you uh, in that environment. But capitalize on all of the other areas. And that's what we do a good job of um, when we teach dogs here is we capitalize on everything. Your dog's not even going to walk with me until the dog proves that it can sit with me. We're not, we're not moving anywhere until you calm yourself in a sit. And once you're calm in a sit, then we can go anywhere. Same thing with car rides. We're not going anywhere in the car if you're acting like a fool in the car. I'm going to wait until you calm down, nice and calm, and then we're going to move and go out in the car. I mean, we're going to uh, drive. But this, and you're not going to come out of the car until you're calm. Go into the car, all this, all this stuff. Everything starts with calmness, okay? And calmness gets you whatever you want, but anything else doesn't. So I would evaluate the, 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 uh, the entire, uh, you know, life with the, with the dog. It will help going forward with, the, uh, with uh, whatever it's fearful of, okay? Because the dog obviously needs more guidance from you, and you can capitalize on that in other environments, calmer environments. Thank you for your question. He gets so over threshold, it's crazy. He's been amazing with all the inside training and is so well behaved and so I will work with the outside no and stop with uh, the treats. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. So, uh, one more thing too, now listen. When you are outside, um, again, be his teacher, right? And definitely tell him no for the behavior, but also leave enough time for him to get bored with it. Don't ever move forward or, or in, in the session without him um, laying down or, you know, just becoming indifferent sort of thing, you know? That's when you're going to have a dog who it takes that step towards, I don't care about this, as opposed to, I really want to, I feel like I need to, you know... I feel for my life type deal. You know what I'm saying? So spend that time being that leader in that environment. It's time and leadership that's going to be the uh, that's going to be the winning solution. Okay. Hey Jeremy, we've raised 17 labs and lab golden pups. For service and guide dogs organization and have never had a reactive pup. Uh, all were a joy to raise and the lab I have now is an angel. But came from a fabulous breeder. It's all in the breeding and training. Man. Yeah, breeding is a powerful thing. So I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, you know, and, and you give me more insight if you, if you have it. But one of the things I always ask people when they purchase a dog is, were you able to see the parents? experience the parents you know because that that that's going to tell you um a lot of what you need to know uh, you know and 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 i would and i and 95 percent of the people i teach 95 percent of the people that i talk to and ask that no weren't able to see the parents you know and um so I always say, okay, next time, anytime you 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 want to purchase a, a puppy, and 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 yes, they may tell you they have ch twelve champions uh, in their bloodline. They may tell you they're all AKC uh, uh, up to date. Uh, you know, they may tell you all this, that, and the other. But um, how how are the how are the parents? You know, how are the parents? Are they fearful? How are the, you know, and, and even the, obviously how are the puppies in comparison to the others, you know, uh, um, those are things that we really need to uh, see. Pat says, yep, absolutely have to see the parents. Come on now. All right. You heard it from a breeder, from a great breeder, from a great service dog, you know, trainer. She, she, okay. This just reinforces that. Um, I really want, uh, I really want people to, to, to not start with a problem. I don't want to see you. You know, like if I don't have to see you, I don't want to see you. But if you go to a through a good breeder and you and you and you're able to experience the parents and and uh, this is the dog that you're looking for, you may not need me. 
You know what I'm saying? Um, that's what I'm trying to say. So, anywho. All right, guys. It's time for me to go live on Instagram. But if you guys have any final questions that you'd like me to answer, go ahead and ask them. Um, because I think we've ran out of questions here. Yeah, I am going on live on Instagram because I want to try and get my Instagram following going. But, um, but anyway, all right, guys, we'll head out. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Please give me a like uh, before you go. Give me a thumbs up, whatever. And uh, we'll be here next time, next week, same time. Thank you guys for watching. Bye-bye. YouTube. I'm going to still stay with YouTube. Might as well. I'm going to go live on Instagram, but I'm going to stick with YouTube. How about that? How about that? All right. Let's do it. <clears throat> uh, we are a dog training company out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. We only work with fearful and aggressive dogs. I shouldn't say only, but we specialize in it. And we're one of the only dog trainers in Wisconsin and in the Midwest that actually take every dog, any dog, any size, any temperament. A lot of dog trainers do not like working with aggressive dogs. Okay. Which is understandable too, because you know, they can do a lot of damage, right? If you don't know what you're doing, it can be a tough thing to, to, uh, to, um, learn too. You know, it's risky. Nobody should be uh, worried about getting bit all the time. It's not for the faint of heart. I'm going to tell you that right now, YouTube. It's not for the faint of heart. It's for peop crazy people like me. You got to be a little bit crazy. Just a little bit. To get this shit going. Okay. Let's do this. How do we do this live? Oh, here we go. And to the story, live, start video live. Can I go? Can I go this way? Can I go this way? Yes, I can. Instagram, what's going on? Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. I don't have a, uh, I guess I don't have a title for this Instagram, but live, but this is the first time we've gone live on Instagram. And, but this is a dog training Q&A, right? So if you got guys got friends or, or if you got a dog or whatever it is and you want to answer or ask a question about dog behavior in any circumstance please let me know because dog behavior dog training all this crap is a is a is a journey it's a journey it's a, it's a learning journey dogmanship it doesn't start you don't start off knowing everything after you've even gone through training with a trainer Okay, your education should continue, and it should not stop. Just because the dog's behavior gets better, your education should continue. These dogs are going to teach you about the next dog, what you need to do, and the next dog. And every dog that you get from this point on should be better than the next, all right? Um, and so learning what it means or learning true dogmanship, it, your journey never stops. Mine started in 2006, and um, I'm still learning. I'm still growing as a dog trainer. I'm always constantly trying to figure out the best way to um, teach, the easiest way to for the dogs to learn, and the the the, the most effective way to communicate to owners on how to uh, duplicate their environment to the one that I have here so that they don't have the issues that they come to me with. So these are the main issues that we deal with. Okay. Biting, jumping, leash aggressive, aggress leash aggression, leash reactivity, barking in the home, uh, leap, fence fighting, um, door charging, 
Uh, let's see, what else? There's another one. Food aggression. Crate aggression. Just overall reactivity and car uh, reactivity. So if any of you guys are watching and you guys, and you guys have questions, feel free to type them in. I don't know if I'll be able to read them. Oh, someone says, hey, from Brazil. Hi, 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 hello, how are you? Um, let's just talk about a, a certain subject then. Okay, that's kind of complex, but you guys will be able to relate to it. Uh, on a, on, a, on a certain level. Okay, so we already talked about, on my Facebook Live, we already talked about dogs uh, or labs and how their, um, the breeding nowadays have changed. So we wanna take that into account. We wanna take that into account as far as um, what we think about um, certain breeds because breeding matters, okay? Um, and when you're dealing with let's say um, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, it doesn't matter the breed, doesn't matter. But what you wanna take into account is what, who are these br breeders breeding? What, what kind of dog are these breeders breeding, right? Um, because they are going to literally change your perception of what that breed or how that breed is. The labs right now, they are changing my perception of what they, of, of, of the breed right now because they are breeding these dogs to be good hunters. But once you, you, you almost sacrifice certain things for certain things. Like for example, I've got two Harlequin Great Danes right now in my kennel. People fall so in love with that Harlequin look and the size that they sacrifice a certain attribute that's very important because both of them are the same in their temperament. And, they're, um, and, and, and that attribute is flight. They're flighty dogs. But they're both similar that they're human aggressive. They're both, they both bite, right? So they, they're kind of sensitive to unwanted pressure, which means they're not, they're not, uh, you know, they're not, um, they're not very receptive of people petting, petting them too much. They're not very receptive of people, uh, uh trying to move them or walking around them while they're sleeping or bothering them while they're sleeping. Um, they're not really receptive dogs, right? Like they're reactive in the sense where, you know, if you annoy them, then they will get aggressive. Okay, so that's tied to breeding because they are in love with the look. And so, but that, so let's take that, let's, let's take that and think about all dogs. Look at the German Shepherd, for example. They are now incorporating uh, spine standards for the German Shepherd breed, which is freaking fantastic. But previous to this, you saw the German Shepherds back in an a, in a evolutionary standpoint go like this. Because we were in love with the look of a dog looking like this. This is the head. We liked that, that, that this was the American way. Okay. And the dog, German Shepherd's back sloped so bad and through AKC, you know, reinforcing that look, uh, the dogs were, were sacrificed in their uh, overall health. And, and so um, what, you're, what you're seeing is, again, um, the lack of integrity in breeding. And this can have a lot to do with the dog that you get. So if you get a dog, if you want to purchase a dog, um, then I would recommend that you, I would highly recommend that you go see uh, the mom and dad. You experience the mother and father of that breed, of that litter. Because without that, you're going to be missing a lot of information that you will need to know. You know what I'm saying? Um, without that, you can end up paying a lot of money with training. 
Um, and so make sure all my people out there who want to have a, their dog that, that you know that, that wants to buy a dog, um, and I'm not judgmental either way. I don't care if you buy it. I don't care if you adopt it. There, there are pros and cons to both. I mean, so whatever is your cup of tea, whatever, do you. Don't let don't worry about anybody judging you either. That's really stupid. But um, all I ask is that if you buy a dog from a breeder, check out the parents. If they don't let you check out the parents, get the hell out of there. Be like, see you later. Puppies are cute, but see you later. Because health problems can come from that. Temperamental problems can come from that. And you'll end up regretting your decision. Talk to many, many, many people who have done that and went, went the wrong path. And they get uncomfortable when I tell them, did you see the parent? Well, what were you thinking? You got to see the parent, specifically the mother. All right. Anyway, any of you guys have any questions about dog behavior, go ahead and type in. This is what this is about. All right. You guys got questions? I got answers. somebody outside making some some loud noise um so anyway we're still live on youtube too um been there for about it says 66 minutes but um i can keep talking because i always can keep talking about dogs all right so let's talk about this this is going to make un people uncomfortable i know there's a lot of there's a, there's a couple of pitbull fans out there all right let's talk about the breed pitbull and and, and this is going to tie into what i was talking about Okay, so don't bash people for hating the breed pit bull. Don't don't bash people. Yes, the news sensationalizes uh, the pit bull, and they, and they get it on film, and they and they uh, you know. Yes, I'm getting your questions. I think. Oh, okay. I got some questions on. I'll I'll be right back. I'll, I'll answer those questions for you, buddy. I'll be right back. But let me just finish my my little uh, spiel on pit bulls. Um, I don't think, I think, again, people are so in love with one breed that they are, uh, they become biased and overlook certain truths about the pit bull breed. So let's just speak a little bit of truth about pit bulls. We all know that in order to have a pit bull, you have to have terrier in that dog. Okay. And I encourage you guys to look up any terrier. That is actually calm. Okay. Yes, you can have calm pit bulls. But what a terrier is at its core is a hunter, which means it will have high prey drive, which means the pit bull, yes, is more likely to be a high prey drive dog and that will need more training than your average Labradoodle. Okay, so I will go and go ahead and say that the pit bull is not for every dog owner. It should not be for the average dog owner. It's like owning a ba Belgian Malinois. So we just got to bring some balance into that conversation. We can't just say, oh, pit bulls are just, they're so wonderful and lovable and kissable. No, they're not. Yeah, they are, but they're not. Okay, they're still terriers. You know what I'm saying? And terriers are tough dogs. They're bred to hunt. Okay. Anybody has any questions about that? Chime in. Or opinions. If you think I'm on a butthole about it, let me know. All right. Got a couple questions on YouTube. While walking uh, the dog, praising them when, they, when they're walking correctly makes them excited. And they usually go faster and break their position. How to fix this, hopefully without food. Yeah, don't praise them. Don't worry about praising them. Okay. Don't worry about praising them yet. You're just praising them too soon. And especially for excitable dogs, any sort of praise will get them to not do what you want them to do. So, and also there's levels of praise, right? So you can just say, good, as opposed to saying, good, boy, and start petting and all that good stuff. You don't got to go through all that. Just say, good boy. That's it. Or just a nice little simple stroke on the head. That'll do it. But sometimes that's too much for the wrong dog. 
So depending on the dog, you gauge that with your dog. So, but sometimes, most of the time, when I'm training, I just say, good boy. And why is seven and eight weeks too young to start minor training? No, I'm not saying it's too young to start minor training. I'm saying this. When you bring your dog home, first of all, well, let's get this out the way too. Okay. First of all, hi, Brianna. How are you? Uh, you should not get your dog. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start this little or stop this rumor right here. Don't get your dog from the breeder any time less than 10 weeks. Don't bring that dog home at four weeks. Ugh. Don't do it. It's too young. The dog has not even been able to learn respect from its mother yet. You ain't giving it enough time. I would say 12 weeks. If the breeder has a problem with that, the breeder should not have a problem with that. The breeder should be respectful of that. 12 weeks. Don't bring your home dog home 12 weeks. The mother could teach that dog a lot of what you don't have to teach the dog if you keep him. If you, if you allow the dog to be with his mother for 12 weeks. So let's let that be the new standard. None of this seven, eight week stuff. Let's squash that. Throw it out the window. Throw it in the garbage. No more. 12 weeks. All right. Minimum. So going forward, you purchase that puppy. You can purchase it before it's born uh, with some of these daggum breeders. You can purchase it before it's born. Negotiate with the, uh, with the breeder that the puppy stays with the, the mother for 12 weeks. And the mother is going to be able to teach valuable, valuable lessons that you won't have to. One of them is how to bite. One of them is how to bite without hurting, injuring. Because the mother is going to teach, put pressure on the puppy when it bites too hard. But if you get that puppy too young, the dog doesn't really learn that and you'll have to do it and... I mean, you don't want to have to do it. Let the mother do it. Let the mother teach that thing respect. Because there are even temperamental uh, uh, lessons that the mother teaches the puppy. True respect. Like, all right, I want you off my tit. Get off my tit. Or if you bite too hard on it, I'm going to bite you. You know? That's those sort of lessons. Or even there's been litters where puppies bully other puppies and the mother comes in and stops the bullying. This is true. Not kidding. The mother is like the moderator. Like the mother is, you know, like teaching socialization in the litter. So many lessons can be learned. All right, I'll stop harping on that. Okay, so, but to go back to what you're saying, no, training starts when you when you bring the dog in the house. Like the first time you bring the dog in the house, you're teaching the dog how to be in its environment. And you can teach little, little lessons every single day through your consistency. So training starts, it's not training, it's living. Living is training. You know, you don't you don't train and then let live. You live with the dog, and that's training. Every single time you interact with your dog, or even don't interact, or choose not to interact, or choose when to interact, that's teaching the dog something. For example, dog's in the crate, and you decide to go let the dog out when it barks. You just taught the dog something. Okay? Or the dog whines to come back inside when it didn't go to the bathroom outside yet the dog whined to come back inside and you let the dog inside you just taught that dog something or uh when you open up the crate or the door dog just goes out assumes it can go out you just taught that dog something so that's training because you can choose how to deal with those things in a productive way. You have to learn how to, you know, you have to learn how to be, make those situations productive. But 
every single interaction is teaching the dog something. As simple as this. Check this out. Uh, when you pet your dog and how you pet your dog, you're teaching your dog something. And the dog is learning something. You know? And so, how long you pet your dog? Or no, even, okay, so that's a very, very, you know, down-to-earth level, right? Okay, here's another one. When you play with your dog, your dog is learning something about you. Your dog is learning how pushy it can or can't be with you when it plays. Because when dogs don't know each other and they first start playing, they're trying to learn about each other. They're not just playing. It's not nothing's going on in their brain. There's a lot going on when they play. Not for dogs who know each other. Not for dogs who the learning, you know, lessons, there's still stuff that goes on. There's still conversation, but it's not as pronounced. When you have two strange dogs that are playing for the first time, there's a lot that can be going on. There's a conversation that's going on, which is how pushy can I be? Or um, how pushy are you going to, to, to let me? Or, uh, you know, what can I get away with? And... What do I what 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 do I have to do? Right? The defensive dog says, What do I have to do to make you stop trying to hump me? Or being so pushy? Maybe I gotta give you a little bit of a, you know, like a nose, whatever. Um, so there's deep conversations in every single interaction that you have with your puppy. And they're smarter than you think. When you put the treat in front of the dog's mouth and the dog just goes for it and you don't make him wait, you're teaching the dog to be pushy. So most people with their puppies underestimate their intelligence and you're just building a reactive, pushy dog that you will in one day have to confront in a major way in order for the dog to actually um, check himself. But if you can capitalize on those little things, you'll never get to that big blow up. So, training starts the moment you bring the dog home. That's a big, that was a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. Um, all right, guys. Anybody on uh, Instagram? This is the first time we've gone live on Instagram. But if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Man, we had a good conversation on Facebook. Um, we were talking about the sort of state of, you know, labs um, and the direction that they're going, the American lab. Like, if you really look at a European lab versus a, a, an American lab, they, they're they very, you can definitely tell that there's a difference in how they, they even are looked, like, structurally-wise. The European labs have more of a square head and our American labs have a more of a narrow, narrow head. But, but also observe the temperament in comparison. The European lab is a very calm thinking dog. And versus the, these American labs that are, that are not, not being bred that way. Um, and so what brings me to my next point too. Um, okay. So, with, with these labs, and obviously these labs are in Wisconsin are bred to hunt, right? So there's probably a lot of hunting lab train, uh, breeders in Wisconsin. What do you want? Do you want a dog who is a really good hunter, but can't control its impulses and is a maniac in the house? Or do you want a dog who's not so good at hunting, but also can be a, a, uh, a family pet? You know, what do you want? That's something that you should take into account with anything that you, any, any dog that you're dealing with. Um, because there are reactive dogs and then there are thinking dogs. And reactive dogs perform well. And but they're inconsistent when they perform. And I know this because I've worked with um, sport dogs uh, for five years 
in the sport of Schutzen, which is a German sport for protection dogs. And in within 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 Schutzen, there's protection work, tracking, and obedience. And um, the dog that is the best in all three of these are just average in all three of these, because you can have breeds that are good in one and not the other. For example, the Belgian Malinois. The Belgian Malinois is the best dog for protection because they're maniacs. High prey drive, prey drive, prey drive, prey drive. Okay, they're crazy. So it can beat the German Shepherd in protection. But the German Shepherd, because they, they the breed has been a, around longer and there's better, there's, there's more established breeders of the German Shepherd. The German Shepherd can track very well and has a clear thinking mind that their obedience is awesome. And then they can also be a really good family pet. Not to say that every Bel Belgian Malinois can't be a, a family pet, but 99% of, of them can't be. Um, so anyway, like I was saying, you want to you want to have a, a dog that is allowed to think as opposed to just react. And this can go for family pets. This can go for rescue dogs. It doesn't matter about their breeding and all that. Um, you want to have a dog who uses its brain, right? A lot of eye contact, involuntary, involuntary, um, uh, involuntarily using their um, eye contact to sort of ask what you're doing or ask what to do as opposed to no eye contact the majority of the time and then them having an assuming mindset small example you have your dog on leash you open up the door you tell the dog to sit how long does it take for your dog to actually look at you if at all how long does it take and i'm not talking about asking for the eye contact i'm talking about waiting for the eye contact do not ask wait that right there is an indication, an indicator of uh, the type of relationship that you want to have eventually with your dog. Okay, the dog should be either very indifferent or looking at you, but also calmly looking at you, asking you, can we move forward? As opposed to, I'm just gonna go out this door. I'm just gonna run out the door. Okay, um, so those are, that's an example of a dog who is reactive versus a dog who is a thinking dog. So you have your dog on leash, you sit him next to you, you open up the door, and the dog just looks out the door like this. On its toes, ready to go. Right? The dog may even try it. And go like that. Okay, tell the dog to sit, and the dog should eventually kind of lean back, and then do this. That's when it's time to go. Without asking for it, though. Can't just do this. And then go. Dog shouldn't be doing this. Spend that type of time with your dog. To build a dog who um, uses its brain to ask. Right? As opposed to just assume that it can do those things. The more the dog is... Uh, the more the dog is okay in doing things by way of... I get to do this, then the closer you are to getting really bad behavior, like biting, okay? If you're constantly having a dog that says, I can do this, I can do this, I'll do this, I'll get on the couch when I want, I'll get on the bed when I want, I'll get on the table when I want, I'll eat when I want, I'll go outside when I want, I'll get out the crate when I want, I'll, I'll do all these things. Those are the dogs that... Um, one day will surprise you. Um, it'll be unpredictable that, that they'll bite. They'll bite. And it's like, hmm, it's not unpredictable to me. Because the most dangerous dog that's, that are out there have, they'll have that type of lifestyle. The I get to do what I want. 
mindset. The um, there's little to no boundaries. And some dogs are going to be pushier than others, obviously. But the dogs that come from abusive situations, abusive situations, um, those dogs they just want to be. They just want to have the correct amount of space uh, for the right amount of time. Those dogs are only dangerous if they feel their life is in danger. But dogs who have no consequences or don't or don't they don't think the consequence is uh, even worth rethinking their actions. Those are the more dangerous dogs, and they can come from perfect homes. So, anywho, all right, Instagram. Uh, shoot, I've been on here for about 15 minutes. I think I'm going to keep this one short. But, um, you guys, give me a, I don't know what it is, a smiley face, a thumbs up. I don't know what the heck it is. But if you watched it and you enjoyed it, um, let me know. Uh, we'll be back next week. Yeah, heart. Give me a heart. Um, we'll be back next week. We'll try this thing again. Um, and we'll take it from there. But, uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Okay, bye. Oh shit. Sorry.